Lord, can you hear me? I'm here, fighting, pressing to remember what you said. But this onslaught of thoughts fills my head with dread and I need you. Like enemies encamped, shrouded in the dark, I can feel the fascination of too many temptations reaching for my heart. So I need you to hear me. For I know your ears are attentive to the righteous and I know that your ways are certain. Even when my worries would trample me to dust, still, I know you are good. Your hand is just. So come now, be the salvation for my sins. Help me to begin again, that you would mend this trend of hopelessness. God, deliver me in my brokenness. I can feel your presence, even now in the ugly, in the mess that has been made. You surround me with your benevolence. Yes, your love is on display, and I can see it. Carving roads through the struggles and the troubles, past temptations and devices that seek to choke me out. So come fear, come failure, come opposition or doubt. Jesus, you are my deliverance. Your grace is sufficient. Trusting you is my only way out. Now I turn my mind to dwell on your truth. Curate the condition of my heart to manifest joy. Be my living proof. Subdue the haters, quell the voices inside. Transform me, Lord. Extinguish my pride. You've won the battle. I trust in your plans. Yes, God. I surrender all my worries, my woes, and my demands into your eternally capable hands. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to say good morning to those watching online as well. Special greeting to you. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we'll be in Philippians chapter 3 today. Always remind you that we have uh, the message notes in the free Bible app, the Version Bible app. You can search under events, and it should pop up right for New City Church. Most of the stuff that will be on the screens and the scriptures that we'll read will be in that as well. Easy for you to follow along. But we are continuing our series called Take Back Your Life, and we've done a few steps already. The first week we talked about waking up, and then we talked about stepping up last week, because uh, I want you to know that we need to be active in our faith. Faith is not about a place where we go. It's about bringing God everywhere that we go in all that we do. And this happens when you use your faith intentionally. It's when you take a step, it's when you take back your life, and there's no better time to do that than the beginning of a new year. And so we've talked about waking up and staying up because we don't go with the current. We don't let our faith be uh, influenced by what's going on around us. We have to be very careful about letting what's going on around us determine the direction of our faith. We wake up, we stay awake, we need to have a clear mind. We talked about stepping up, and I asked you a question, if God calls your name, what will you do? Will you step up? And part of that is to remove some things that don't need to be there, but to replace that with things that do need to be there. And today is all about moving up. And don't start singing, moving on up. I know that I faintly got the end of that TV show when I was a kid, and I, the only thing I remember is that the song. So, But it is time to move and to move up into what God has for you and what God has for me. Now, for some of us, when we hear move up, we need to move on from something that's holding us back. We could spend a whole year talking about moving on. But for some of us, that, need, that means that we need to embrace the new things that God might be doing among us. And still for others, we need to refuse to let our past, our mistakes, our doubts, our fears, we can't let that absorb our attention as God tells us to move up into what's next. I recently read a story about two monks that had just left their morning prayers. 
And they came across an elderly woman who was trying to cross a small stream. And the banks were very deep on both sides. And, and she was a little bit stubborn and a little bit determined to do it herself. But these two monks offered to help her. And so one monk would get down in front and would clear the path. And the other monk, the best way he knew how, he said, I'm just going to carry the woman on my back and I will help her cross. So the first monk gets down into the stream, clears it away, stops the current a little bit, moves things out of the way. The other monk is carrying this woman on, her ba- on his back. They get across the stream. She's very thankful, and they go on their way. And they get down the road a few miles, and the first monk is just quietly walking. And the second monk, who ironically was a younger monk, who looks up to the older one, uh, just started to talk out loud a little bit. He said, you know, we've been walking for a while and, and my clothes are still wet. You know, my, my back hurts a little bit and the woman didn't really say thank you more than once. And, you know, I, I know we do that out of the goodness of our hearts, but it, my clothes are wet, my feet hurt, my back hurts. And, and he just keeps talking and talking and talking. And the first monk doesn't say anything. Anyone get annoyed when you're complaining and nobody else is? And so the older monk is just letting him talk. And then he finally breaks down and he says, listen, I know that you didn't carry her, but it it seems like you're not upset. Like your clothes are wet, your 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 shoes are you know full of all this kind of stuff. Why? What's wrong? And he says, "Listen, um, you know, I I was there with you. It seems that you haven't stopped carrying that woman, and I let her go five miles ago." (laughs) And so sometimes that's what happens for us. For often we're we're like that monk who can't let go, can't let go of the pain, can't, and we still carry the things around when somebody else seems to have no problem at all. And so we're going to camp out in just a few verses today written by the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, probably familiar to some. Paul says this towards the end of his letter to the church in Philippi. He says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so Paul would use the metaphor of foot races a lot. But in this way, he's describing his life as involving the continual acts of forgetting what is behind and the relentless centering of all of his energy on, and, and his interests on what lies ahead. And so I probably could summarize it best this way, and we'll keep coming back to this phrase. Here's what I see Paul telling us. Don't dwell on your past. Instead, grow in the knowledge of God by concentrating on your relationship with God now. Here's a hard one. Realize that you are forgiven. And then move on to a life of faith and obedience. Look forward to a fuller life and a more meaningful life because of your hope in Jesus Christ. Very simple what he's asking us to do. So what do we need to do to move up, to take back our lives? Well, the first one, number one, don't dwell on the past. Paul says right there, one thing I do, I forget what is behind and I strain towards what is ahead. Now, I want to help you understand who's writing these words. Think about who's writing these words. This is the Apostle Paul. Now, he wasn't always known as Paul. God changed his name. But Paul had a past that he liked to forget about. We don't know exactly what he could be referring to, but he might be referring to the days where he was a Pharisee who was named Saul. He might more specifically referring to the days where his confidence were in his abilities and in his knowledge. And in fact, earlier in the chapter, he talks about, he kind of gives you a resume of who he is, and then we'll talk about what he thinks of that resume. In Philippians 3, up in the beginning of the chapter, verses 4 to 6, this is Paul telling this church, hey, if anybody has confidence in their own abilities or knowledge, get in line because I'm number one. He says, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others had reason for confidence in their own efforts, he emphatically says, I have even more. Listen to this resume. It may not mean much to us in the, you know, the 21st century in the modern American church, but he's writing this to a lot of Jewish people and Gentile people. Listen to this resume. Think of the Old Testament when you think, he says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel 
and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, which the first king of Israel came out of the tribe of Benjamin. And he just says this. He says, I was a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous, so passionate, that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I mean, Paul's life before Jesus was all about promoting Judaism, promoting Yahweh, promoting the one true God, but it was also about condemning Christians. History would tell us he became the arch persecutor of the church. Not the archbishop, the arch persecutor of the church. And his reputation was known well beyond Jerusalem. Anyone and everyone that opposed the law of the Old Testament, which he said, I obeyed it without fault. Anyone that obeyed, disobeyed the law of the Old Testament was not just seen as a problem, they were seen as a threat. Especially, Paul concentrated all of his efforts on this group of people that followed this Jewish rabbi named Jesus. They started to preach about Jesus. They started to say crazy things like, yes, we know that he was crucified, but we saw him alive and he ascended into heaven and now we are doing the same things that he did. And the real one that got Paul very upset as they said, and he is God. This Jesus is God. And so they would tell them, stop preaching about Jesus. Stop telling us in the name of Jesus or we'll put you in prison. They said, go ahead, and then angels would break them out of prison. This upset Paul. So these people were considered threats, so they were either thrown in prison or they were put to death, all at the instruction and the authority of Saul. The first martyr, the first person to give their life for the Christian faith was a man named Stephen. And listen to what happens at the end of Stephen's life in Acts chapter 7. It says, at this, they, the crowd, mainly Pharisees, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. They all rushed at Stephen. They dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Paul had every reason to forget the past. He held the coats of those who would stone Stephen. History would tell us he would offer to hold their coats because as insidious as this sounds, you can throw stones a lot faster when you take your coat off. So he says, let me hold your coat for you. He lived his whole life. I mean, he was under the great Gamaliel, the greatest teacher of all teachers. He was, under, he was next in line, they think, to be the high priest of Israel. He lived his whole life in what he thought was full devotion to God. And he really believed doing all of these things was right. But God got his attention, and it changed everything. But as you can see, Paul keeps talking about his past. His past was part of him. Paul, not just in this chapter, but in many other instances, he would live with regrets. He made mistakes for which he was ashamed. He lived part of his life focused on himself and what he could achieve. He had misguided ambitions. He would say it over and over again. He seemed for as much, and and as much as God changed his life, the past just kept coming up. In fact, in his early days as Paul, many people thought, and they had trouble believing that he was actually converted. I mean, think about Paul as a terrorist to the early church. And then he walks in the door one day and says, just joking, like, I'd love to worship Jesus now. You guys have a seat for me? Like, you don't think that everyone was a little skeptical? His conversion, his new life, they had a really hard time believing that it was genuine. He was a man who was defined by what he did and defined by his past. But remember, he uses the metaphor of a foot race. He says, my life now is the continual forgetting what's behind. And I'm going to center all my energies on what's ahead. We've got to do the same. Now, you may not be a terrorist, but we've all done things for which we are ashamed. We have regrets. We've all made mistakes. We all have had misguided ambitions. Yes, even as we try to follow Jesus. But in the midst of all of that, we've got to make a decision to not dwell on the past. Why? Because I think this is what really what Paul is saying. We live in this tension of what we have been and what we want to be. There's a tension of what we have been and what we want to be. Really, I would say who God wants us to become. 
There's that tension. Paul talks about a lot. He says there's a spirit inside of you now, but the flesh keeps trying to pull you back. But because our hope is in Jesus, our hope is not in an oval office. Our hope is not in a Congress. Our hope is not in a leader. Our hope is not in our marriage. Our hope is not in our kids or our ambitions. Our hope, because it's in Jesus, we can let go. We can let go of guilt. I, I, heard, I even saw it this week. Listen, God never brings up your past, so why do you keep doing it? He's done. It's over. We can let go of mistakes. We can let go of regrets, and we can look forward. So the question is, and, and you don't have to answer this, but I want you to think about, do you have regrets, mistakes, misguided ambitions? Do you have things in your life for which you are ashamed? What do you need to forget and leave behind? And I know that word forget is really hard. Even when you talk with psychology and counseling, forgetting is a hard thing to do. Now for Paul, the way he's using this word, it did not mean that he was trying to obliterate the memory of his past. Because those things were part of his identity. In fact, I really believe that God handpicked Paul because there's no better person, I believe, that who is so zealous in following God for to translate that message to new Christians. God used everything in Paul's past to help him launch as the greatest church planner the world has ever seen. Those things are part of his identity. So what did Paul mean that I'm going to forget my past? He said, listen, for me, forgetting is my conscious refusal to let those regrets and mistakes and guilt absorb my attention. It's not going to impede my progress towards what God has for me. So what about you? What about me? Now, I don't want you to hear forget what is behind and think forgetting means that you need to obliterate the memory of your past. Those things are part of you. Even if you are far away from Jesus, watch how God will redeem those things into your future. But forgetting does mean this, that those things no longer define you. Forgetting means that you and I, we make a conscious decision to refuse to let those things absorb our attention. You've got to have a conscious decision to refuse to let those things absorb your attention. They can't impede your progress as you choose to move up into what God has for you. So what do we need to do? We don't dwell on our past. Because we live in that tension of what we have been and what we want to be. Now to get out of this holding pattern, because I think a lot of people sit there and say, I don't know if I can get over my past. We've got to make the choice to not dwell on it. Now Paul would have a radical conversion in fact, Jesus would meet him in, in some sort of vision. I, I don't know exactly, I mean, it's very vague how the description is, but it was Jesus who met Paul on the road to Damascus. And we know that that's a wonderful phrase, on the road to Damascus. Listen, Paul had letters in his bag to go to Damascus to murder more people. And so on the road to Damascus, the heavens open up and it's Jesus. We don't know if it was a physical Jesus that stood or a, an appearance or Paul heard a voice, but it was Jesus himself who said, why are you persecuting me? And everything changed. He was blinded. He had scales on his eyes. And, and everything changed for Paul. And he had a wake-up kind of moment. He didn't dwell on this. It, it, his wake-up moment helped him not... It brought a kind of a new assessment of his goals in life. Gave him an overwhelming desire to know Jesus. And he would say that his present life was a pursuit in this new direction. Listen to what he says in verses 7 through 11 in the same chapter of Philippians. So he lists his resume. Remember the resume? Circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe. I followed the rules better than you did. He says, I once thought these things were what? Valuable. But I now consider them. Listen, they were valuable. I consider them worthless because of what Jesus has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of what? Knowing Jesus. For his sake, because of Jesus, I've discarded everything else Counting it, and the New Living Translation calls it counting it as all as garbage. Some translations count it as dung. He said, it's all garbage so that I could gain Jesus and become one with him. I no longer count my righteousness or my right standing before God through obeying the law. Rather, I become right with God through faith in Jesus, which I can tell you was hard for Paul to accept. He says, because listen, God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. And listen to the desire in his voice. He says, I want to know Christ. 
I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Would anybody want that mighty power? That ra- he says, I want that. And, and, and a verse that we don't all say amen to, he says, I want to suffer with him. I want to share in his death so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. What a forgetting the past moment. He says, this is my focus now. So it's always about forgetting the past and straining towards what lies ahead. But, but I want you to see the, these words right now. I, I just have a question. The second thing I want you to understand is what about right now? What about right now? Now, listen, we say don't dwell on your past. But I love what Paul is saying in this whole chapter. He says, I want you instead to grow in the knowledge of God by concentrating on your relationship with God when? Right now. And realize that you're forgiven. We've got to be careful with verses like this. Because it talks about forgetting what is behind, focusing on what's ahead. Those are great things. Don't get me wrong. But there is a space between our past and our future. And it's called the right now. We don't like the right now. We don't. Some of us want to forget the past. It's too painful. It's full of regrets. I want to make things right. Amen, past. I want to forget my past. I'm ready to go. But all of us want to get to what is ahead. It's a part of who we are as human beings. We don't like to wait. Do we? If anyone has kids, you don't like to wait. Mommy, what are we having for dinner on Thursday? Hold your horses. I don't even know what we're having for lunch today. Hey, aren't we going on vacation in July? I'm like, it's January. Like, what do you think we're going to do on the third day of our vacation? Daddy, when am I going to be able to drive? My six-year-old asked me that. I said, you know what? I'm already starting to feel the tension. Mommy's going to do the driving lessons. I'm just going to, I'm just going to stay home and mow the grass. Even if it doesn't need mowed, I'm just going to mow the grass that day. But we're always, we, we always grow up because we, we want to be kids. And then all the kids want to be teenagers. And all teenagers want to go to college. And when you're in college, you want to get out thinking that all you're going to have to worry about in life is essays. Man, I would love to go back to college. Where all I had to worry about was essays. And then, we, you know, we want to move from an apartment to a house. And then we want to get the better job. We want to get the better career, the step up the ladder. We want to get to retirement. Like, it's all about the next thing. But a lot of us forget about, like, right now. You know, one of my mentors always said, life is just a bunch of todays. It, 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 that's what it is. We don't like to wait. And, of course, you know I have to throw football into a message anytime I can. But in college sports, I never, I never got to play college sports. I had a few friends that got to go play for big-time universities, and I was so proud of them, so cool to watch them, sometimes on TV. Uh, some of you may know some famous athletes. We had some famous ones come out of UD. Uh, but listen, there's an aspect in college sports that is letting them know, like, hey, we're, we're grateful for how great you were in high school, but we, we've got some great players on our team right now, and you're just, we're going to recruit you. You're going to get a full scholarship, but we're going we're gonna to do what's called, we're going to redshirt you. And so when a freshman athlete is recruited to play for an athletic program, sometimes that athlete has to wait. And sometimes when you're redshirted, you actually get extra years of eligibility. You still get to practice with the team, you travel with the team, you're trained by the coaches, but otherwise, you are not probably going to play in any games. An invitation to redshirt is saying, we value who you are, but you've got to wait your turn. Now, a lot of redshirt athletes will get upset about that, and they'll transfer to other schools. And they're not really enthusiastic about redshirting. But sometimes it can turn out great because there are advantages to redshirting. You get familiar with the playbook. You get stronger in the weight room. You get to know the system better than anybody who's just thrown right out onto the field. You have an extra year or two to develop in order to be more effective. That's a smart choice. Some great NFL athletes started out as redshirt athletes. And you'll see some of them up here. You've got guys like Le'Veon Bell. You've got guys like Russell Wilson and Clay Matthews. You've got Jordy Nelson. You've got Antonio Brown. You've got J.J. Watt, which I believe, if I'm correct, all six of those, as great as they are, none of them are playing this weekend in the playoffs. And neither is my team. I know, I know. But what made it so beautiful last week, watching my team lose, was a few hours later watching the Cowgirls lose. So that was nice as well. So that's just, it helps me cleanse myself a little bit. So I have to pick a new horse in the race, and, I, and for the first time, I'm going to say, go Bills. So it's my team now. So I'm going for the underdogs. And so th- these, this is the invitation. You wait, and these guys all waited their turns. In fact, some guys who get drafted into the NFL, they'll sit on the bench, and they wait. 
And I think those guys actually end up turning out better than getting a number one overall draft pick and you're thrown in there week one and you're like, oh, I was not ready for this. Now, sometimes this is what happens with our faith. Sometimes forgetting what is behind doesn't automatically and immediately turn into what is ahead because we need to embrace right now. We need to embrace what God is doing in our hearts and our minds right now because what he's doing right now, I know, prepares us for what is ahead. And too often I've seen this. I've seen people have a radical change in their life, and I celebrate that. They make the choice to forget what is behind, and then they immediately want God to show them what lies ahead. And all the while, what are they missing out on? The moments of right now, where God takes time to develop them, to teach them, to mold them, to shape them for what lies ahead. Remember, Paul says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but according to Old Testament standards, he's pretty perfect. But he says, I I haven't obtained it yet. I take hold for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. He's saying, it's about right now for me. Paul would say, right now I'm focused on spiritual progress. Paul's focus right now is to know Jesus, to be like Jesus. His words would echo that he wants to be Jesus and what all that Jesus had in mind for him. For Paul, this was a long process. And it's easy to read through the New Testament, especially like in books of Acts, like the book of Acts. You have to remember the book of Acts is about 30 to 40 years of church history. We just go to the next chapter and we're like, oh, wow, that was, that was really quick. Like, look at all these churches popping up. We forget that the life of Paul in the New Testament, he had a right now kind of season. He had to forget what was behind. And I would venture to say he had to let a lot of people forget what was behind for him before he could look forward to what lies ahead. It's easy to assume, if you don't read all of it, it's easy to consume that as soon as Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, that the next day he went and started planting churches around the ancient world. This just isn't true. In fact, in Galatians chapter 1, I don't want to read the whole chapter to you, but in this chapter, Paul would specifically talk about the years that he would, insp- he would spend embracing the right now. He worked very hard to forget what was behind He worked very hard to say, I want to look towards what lies ahead. After his conversion, Paul spent years preparing for the ministry to which God had called him. This time was necessary for Paul to forget what was behind, to come to terms with his own forgiveness. He even would say, I'm the chief of all sinners. He would say, listen, I've got some things going on in my heart too. He needed to embrace this time. Time was necessary for him to develop. And I'm thankful as a preacher, as a student of the Bible, as somebody who clearly has God's word written down in its theology and all of the systematic stuff in there, I'm so glad Paul took his time. Why? Because he became a great church planner. He became a great leader. He became a phenomenal writer. Most of what we believe as born-again believing, Holy Spirit baptized Christians comes from the theology of the Apostle Paul, who God used his past as an Old Testament theologian and scholar and said, this is how it was done before Jesus is better. And he would help us. And, And so Paul would take that time. So I would ask, what about you? Maybe it's not you, but maybe it's your neighbor. We so bad, we want to move from the past right to the future without giving any regard to right now. We don't want to take the time to invest in our relationship with God right now. I love how innocently kids pray. God, heal that person right now. And I'm like, well, it might be a long time process here. But they have that mentality. But the, the years that you take, I'll never forget my college president said, the years that you take to sharpen your tools is never wasted. So if God doesn't seem like he's getting you ready for what lies ahead yet, embrace the right now. We don't want to take the time. We don't like the idea of right now because it's in the, but I would say this, it's in the waiting where God does his best work for what lies ahead. So maybe you've been waiting a year or two years. Some of you get mad when God makes you wait two weeks. I want to tell you some people that you're in good company with if you have to wait. Hopefully it doesn't take this long. Remember Noah? He spent 120 years building a boat that he would only live on for 378 days. Abraham and Sarah, they waited 25 years for their promised son Isaac to be born. 25 years after God told them that it would happen. So God didn't say, hey, Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a son. Boom, surprise. 
Positive pregnancy test. That was 25 more years. Rebecca. She waited 20 years to be the mother of Jacob and Esau. What about our boy Moses? It moves very quickly in Exodus. But we believe Moses was about 40 years old when God spoke to him in the burning bush. Actually, he was about 40 years old when he murdered the Egyptian and spent 40 years in the wilderness, and then 40 more years, God would talk to him. So Moses was 80 years old when God said, okay, now you're ready to be the deliverer of Israel. David, anointed as the next king of Israel, goes back out and tends the sheep, has to wait 30 years. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, waits 30 years to begin his earthly ministry. And ironically, guess what? He's still waiting to return. And Paul, the guy we've been talking about, Galatians chapter 1, would tell us he waited 17 years between his conversion to the start of his ministry. So sometimes forgetting what is behind doesn't immediately turn into what lies ahead. If God has you in a right now moment, embrace it. Because if you ignore it, what lies ahead might take longer and longer and longer. So we've been saying, don't dwell on your past. Instead, grow in the knowledge. Focus on your relationship right now. Realize you are forgiven. Move on to the life of faith and obedience. Look forward to a fuller life and a more meaningful life because of your hope in Jesus. So you embrace the right now. But I'm not going to leave you hanging because we also, in order to move up, we need to be ready for what lies ahead. Paul says, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, I know I'm not oblivious. Some of us struggle with forgetting the past. Maybe the mistakes are too many. The regrets are things we don't even want to talk about. The guilt is sometimes too much. But others of us, when I tell you, hey, we get to forget the past, you're like, I'll sign up for that right now. What do I do? And then some of us that we struggle with the right now because it is so hard to wait on God. Especially after we've done all that hard work to forget the past, we're ready for what's next, and God says, hold on. But a lot of us, I hope you would embrace the season of preparation. But I think it's safe to say that most of us struggle with embracing what lies ahead. You say, no, no, no I'm excited. Listen, don't get me wrong. The idea of the future is exciting. But let me remind you, we struggle with the future because the future is uncertain. It's unknown. Here's an ugly word. It's new. And it requires change. Sometimes we wait too long to change. Maybe it's because we're afraid. Maybe it's because the future is uncertain, so I'm not going to step out in faith. Maybe it's because we've had to try something new. I just hope and pray that none of our lives turn out the same way as Blockbuster Video. You guys remember Blockbuster Video? If not, I have a picture there. Blockbuster, I remember driving by. It was like, I, I didn't live here when they had Blockbuster Videos. Was there a Blockbuster Video close by? Okay, come on. Remember going into Blockbuster Video. Maybe you're old enough and you're like, oh, I hated going in there. It smelled like popcorn and sweat and all kinds of weird stuff. And I remember going to Blockbuster Video. It was like the highlight of the week. I got home from school and I was waiting. Sometimes I would find my dad's or mom's blockbuster card and just, oop, it's on the, well, who put this on the kitchen table? I mean, what, Friday night, what are we going to do? I mean, you couldn't wait to go to Blockbuster Video so you could rent that movie, the VHS, not the DVD, that came later. And then they said, you can rent video games. My mom loved that. She's like, oh, you want to try this video game? I don't have to buy it. It's $5. You rent it for the weekend. I said, well, mom, I got to try to beat the game before I take it back. So I'm going to be on the video games all weekend. I mean, you couldn't wait to show your friends the movie that you saw in the movie theater. And now it's pretty quick turnaround, a movie to go from movie theater to streaming or to DVD. But do you remember how long we had to wait? It was like nine months, a year. And you're like, oh, man, I, I saw this movie last summer. We're going to rent it. And how many of you would get frustrated? You put it in your VCR and it wasn't rewound. Even though the sticker right there says what? Be kind, please rewind. You could even buy a rewinder. Who had, my, dad, my grandpa had a rewinder. You know, he'd take it right from the VCR because he didn't want to ruin the VCR. He took it from the VCR and put it in the tape rewinder. I mean, you would drive to the store. You would hope and pray that they had your movie. You would rent it. If you were a good rule follower like me, you would remember to rewind it. 
you would try to bargain with your mom and dad saying, well, I mean, they have better popcorn here. I know it's like $18, but they have better popcorn here and better snacks and sodas and nachos. And, and then, but also, I mean, you got to watch it on Friday night, probably rewatch it Saturday, but it was never my responsibility to drive back to the store to take the movies back because you had to avoid the late fee. Now, things were good for a while. Blockbuster was the happening thing. Then they had like Hollywood video. They had all kinds of different stores. And then Netflix came along. Now, not the Netflix that you know now. How many of you got Netflix DVDs in the mail? I got those. Those were cool. Do you know, I I read, I I was deep diving on Blockbuster. It was an interesting sermon preparation moment. But Blockbuster actually knew about Netflix. The CEO of Blockbuster actually had an opportunity to purchase Netflix. But they weren't interested. Blockbuster waited too long to change. They were quoted in saying, I'm uncertain about this. DVDs in the mail. Like, Blockbuster is an experience. You want to drive to the store. This introvert, I'm like, you'll mail it to my house, and all I have to do is mail it back to you? Sign me up. They weren't sure about what a streaming movie was, or people aren't going to watch TV shows streaming for hours and hours on end until Netflix asks you, are you still watching? (laughs) Don't act like you haven't had that moment. Netflix is like, are you, you're still watching? (laughs) See, Blockbuster wasn't willing to change. And guess what? Now they're a thing of the past. They're gone. So the question is, what lies ahead for you? What's God asking you to do for him as you work to deal with the past and embrace the right now and get ready for the future? Let me ask, here's a bigger question. How many of us are stuck still dealing with our past and we're not able to move to what lies ahead? But how many, I think this is more dangerous, how many of us are content with the right now because we don't want to change to experience what lies ahead. You know what I know this is? The more I'm in leadership, the more I'm around people, there's two words that really scare people. New and change. New and change are scary. We like to talk about it, but it's another thing to embrace it. I love this saying. This is a cartoon. It says, who wants change? Everybody raises their hand. Then the same leader says, who wants to change? Nobody raises their hand. We all want it, right? Hey, well, who wants a new thing? A new th- who, wants to, who wants change? Who wants things to get progressed? Who wants to do what's necessary in order to change? Everyone puts their hands down. I mean, the good news is this. Our God has always been in the business of new things. He sprinkles it all throughout the story of Scripture. He says this to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 43. He says, I am about to do something what? New. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in dry wasteland. I love that verse. God says this to the prophet Ezekiel. He says, I will give you a what? A new heart. And I will put a new spirit in you. And here's the hard part. This is what God is saying is what's going to require. He says, I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. I pray that for us. Would God, would you take out the stubborn, stony hearts and give us tender, responsive hearts that say yes? He says, I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Somebody who's pretty happy about the new, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. He would say this to the church in Ephesus. He would say, since you have heard about Jesus and you've learned the truth that comes from it, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Listen, I get it. Forgetting what is behind, a lot of us, that takes a lot of work. And then I think a lot of us get to the point where, okay, God is working on me right now. And I think I've seen it. And I haven't been around a church maybe as long as some of you, but I grew up in the church. And I start to see it now that I think a lot of us just get comfortable with right now. No, no, I need to know more of the Bible before I step out into that. No, 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 I need to pray more before God tells me. No, 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 I need to learn more about the Holy Spirit. No, I need to go to another Bible study. I need to go to another this. I need to go to this conference. I need to do this until then, then I'll be ready to say yes to Jesus. We got so comfortable in the right now. And as hard as it is to trust God, 
as hard as it is to trust His Word concerning the future, as hard as it is to trust the Holy Spirit when He asks you to do something, let's just be honest, that you don't want to do, you've got to trust that God, what He wants for your life, is always what's best for you. Even if it requires those two nasty words, new and change. He wants what's best for you. So the challenge I keep putting before us is that when God wants something from us that seems impossible, sometimes we think obedience is voluntary. But God loves you too much and God loves me too much to let us stay comfortable. I want to make a commitment for all of us to learn to trust the voice of the Holy Spirit. A commitment to obey God in His direction for the future with these three words, no matter what. Even if it involves those ugly words of new and change. Because you know what God's going to keep doing? He's going to keep calling us higher and higher and higher. Because He knows, and I hope you know, on the other side of obedience is always a blessing. Every time. You don't think they made fun of Noah for 120 years for building a boat? When I don't know how the science worked, but nobody really knew what rain was. And he says, the whole world's going to flood. And they're like, oh, I don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, you don't think people made fun of Moses, who used to be the prince of Egypt, and now he's a simple sheep herder, and he comes to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, and he says, you let my people go. It required new, it required change. He's going to keep calling us higher and higher, because if you don't believe that there's a blessing on the other side of obedience, check God's track record. That's his word. And you're going to get to do a way of knowing God that you couldn't experience any other way. So do you want to take back your life? It's not just about waking up. It's not about just stepping up when your name's called. It's about moving up, which means forgetting the past, embracing the right now. And when the what lies ahead, when it smacks you in the face, let us not be people to say no, because that requires new. That requires change. I think the phrase that kills so many of the movements of God is when somebody very innocently says, well, we've never done it that way before. And I say, good. Because I still think there's ways of doing church that nobody's discovered yet. I still think there's ways of following Jesus that aren't defined yet. We sang it this morning, will you say yes? I've challenged you for years. The biggest challenge, I think, in all of our lives as Christians is will you say yes before God tells you what you're saying yes to? He told Noah to, I mean, I, I keep going back to Noah. He told him to build a boat in the middle of the desert. It's not like he told him to build a boat on the, you know, on the shores of Galilee. He tells Moses, somebody who was ashamed for 40 years for murdering somebody, he says, you are the deliverer. And what did Moses do? I, I can't go. You're not going to use me. What, what do I have? I can't speak. And God says, do you trust me? I'll send Aaron with you. That staff in your hand, you take that. I will rain down plagues from heaven, and then Pharaoh will let people go. I mean, even Jesus in his hometown. When they said Jesus of Nazareth, it was like an insult. But we've got to embrace new. We've got to embrace change. Because on the other side of those decisions to say yes to Jesus is a blessing. So let's look at our verse again. Paul says, not that I've already obtained all this or have been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I'll say it one more time. Don't dwell on your past. Instead, grow in the knowledge of God by concentrating on your relationship with Him right now. You are forgiven. Some of you need to hear that. You are forgiven for those regrets and mistakes. If you've asked God for forgiveness, He is, he is just and true, and He promises to forgive you. And then you know what you need to do? Brush yourself off and move on to a life of faith and obedience. Look forward to the fuller life. Because when God says it's time for what lies ahead, may we be people who say yes. When God says this is going to be new, yes. It's going to require change, yes. So for some of us, it's about the past. Do you have regrets and mistakes? Do you have things in life you're ashamed of? What do you need to forget? Remember, forgetting is not 
a refusal to think about it anymore. It's a refusal to let those things absorb your attention. Some of you need to move on. Because if you have been forgiven by Jesus, He's already moved on. Now, sometimes, forgetting what is behind, we want what lies ahead right now. But some of you need to embrace right now. Let God keep working on you. It's in the waiting where He does His best work. But I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you don't stay there. Don't stay in the right now. Because when God says, it's time, will you say yes? Even if it requires those two ugly words of new or change. Even when God asks us to do things we're not ready for, it's always safe to always say yes to Jesus. Every time. It is always safe to always say yes to Jesus. So let's stand as we pray and close together. Heavenly Father, would you, would you bring to our minds and to our hearts the aspect of moving up that, that we need to work on? God, I pray for some of us. We may have been Christians and followers of Jesus for decades. But just like Paul, every once in a while, the past rears its ugly head. Our mistakes, the regrets, maybe misguided ambitions, even as a follower of Jesus, we've done things in the name of God that we now regret. God, would you help us to move on from the past? To not let it impede us. To not let it grab our attention all the time. But God, even as we forget the past and look forward to what lies ahead, would you continue to shape us and mold us in the right now? Help us to understand that we're in good company if we need to wait on the word of the Lord. God, that we keep praying, that we keep reading your word, that we keep spending time in your presence, that we keep making the house of the Lord a priority, that we keep listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And when that moment comes, Lord, when what lies ahead is here right now, God, would we be so emphatic in our response to say yes, even if it requires something new, even if it requires us to change, even if our preferences get shaken upside down, God, would we say yes to you? Because God, we may not trust systems, we may have a hard time trusting people, but God, if you're behind it, we trust you. We trust your spirit. So God, I pray that you would be with us as we go from here. God, we have all made a choice to wake up God, we want to step up when our name is called, but God, today we are ready to move up and into what you have for us. But God, I pray that you begin to prepare our hearts now for next week, God, and our final week, God, that, you would un that we would understand that all of that is not possible without us receiving the power from the Holy Spirit. That it's the one thing that separates us, God, that we have the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God inside of us. God, may, will you have us be desperate for the Holy Spirit? Would you have us be like the early church that needed the Holy Spirit like they needed oxygen? God, help us to depend on your Spirit. If your Spirit is in it, God, it makes us more ready to say yes. So make us aware of what the Spirit is doing and make us desperate for the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you'll be with us tonight as we pray together as a church, God, as we come through our 21 days of fair, prayer and fasting, God, that you would begin to do these things in our hearts. God, as we take back our lives. God, we ask that you be with us as we go from here. And we pray all of that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Can't wait to see you next week for Take Back Your Life, week number four. God bless you.